Um, what we also wanted to do is kind of talk about how COVID-19 has impacted communities of color, uh, tribal communities, and students nationwide. And um, we wanted to get a few different perspectives on that particular um, issue and from those communities. So um, we, we asked you know, three really great experts um, to come and join us and talk about you know, the experience of COVID-19 um, among, um, among those com uh, communities and how they've fared and the challenges and, you know, and some of the successes in that, that area. So um, with us, we have uh, Marita Coley, who is president and CEO of the um, Multicultural Media, Telecom and Internet Council. Um, very well known here in Washington. Um, and we also have um, Evan Marwal, who's the founder and CEO of Education Superhighway. And we're thrilled to have Evan. And also, I'm really thrilled to have uh, Matthew Rantanen, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, who's the Director of Technology for the Southern California Tribal Chairmen's Association. So um, I think we wanted to, you know, kind of get your perspective on how, how these communities are experiencing the internet. Um, uh, let me just go first to Morita. Um, you know, broadband internet access is obviously essential. Um, it, a significant number of Americans, particularly people of color and low income, are you know are having challenges. Can you explain how you know lack of broadband access is is unique to that particular community? I'm not actually sure that Marita made it across. I don't see her name on the list. Okay, well let me um. Let me just rephrase that in terms of, um, you know, folks in tribal lands, Matt. <laughs> if you, while we wait on Marita to kind of join us, I apologize. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you repeat again? Sorry, I was <laughs> yeah, looking. I mean, for... you know, broadband access is, is super important. Um, the network, generally, for folks that had it, performed very well. You know, according to Nick Beamster and um, uh, yeah. Matt Tooley. Uh, but you know, other communities are, you know, have different experiences. Um, and you know, what's been the experience for folks in tribal lands? Well, I, I think, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, things that COVID-19 did for the, for the tribal communities is help everybody else in the United States realize how disconnected they are. Um, it, it, was a, it was a great illustration on, on um, I mean, there is not a better marketing tool than COVID-19 on why you need broadband in your home. And the understanding of how many people actually don't have broadband in their home uh, was, was very apparent when um, when the stay at home orders came into effect and the tribes went on lockdown, and then again when uh, when the school um, school districts and stuff decided to have uh, you know a virtual learning space instead of a, a physical learning space at the school, um, you know the the institutions were realizing that you know large percentages of their of their tribal students didn't have access to enough capacity of broadband. Uh, Sometimes they were accessing it on their mom's cell phone uh, and doing things like that and, and not being able to perform their school functions. So where the broadband existed, um, you know, it was it was functioning well and it did stay up and, and run and, and it was very effective uh, where where it was lacking. Um, it was very apparent and, you know, it became one of the, the biggest focuses, I think, during COVID-19 is like how disconnected our tribes. What are the solutions what are the band-aids we can do during COVID? And then how do we solve this as we come out of COVID? You know, and, and did, did, do you think that the community, the communities themselves understood um, how, whether they had good broadband or not um, until this actually happened? I mean, cause a lot of folks, um, you know, have really good, you know, have good wireless and feel like that's good enough. Um, but when you have to do things like, you know, participate in a conference or, you know, watch Netflix or, or do other types of things like high, you know, high, low latency gaming, you know, it becomes really apparent. Yeah. Those of us that are all suffering from Zoom fatigue, as they call it now, um, we definitely know that, uh, you know, that your broadband connection is as, as good as it is. And can it perform the functions like we are doing today? Uh, very, very few people um, in the reservation space that were operating off of a cellular connection or you know, a non a non broadband uh, connection to the internet, we're able to perform these functions in school, education, uh, and then telecommuting were the most descriptive of that. Um, and you always have a, you know, lack of a take rate for one reason or another in any community. But in the tribal community, um, we did see a lack of take rate on on buying broadband services from networks that did exist and could serve their homes until COVID. Um, when when they realized that the functions that they now needed to perform over their broadband connection or over their connection 
needed to be more stable and more more of a broadband connection to be able to function. So, so I think they did realize that I need to step up into that next level. I need that always on connectivity um, and and a certain speed and and throughput that allows me to function um, in the world as it is today. Uh, later, Matt, I'm going to come back and ask all of you guys whether you know that realization on behalf of of your stakeholders in your community have made them realize, and, and speaking for all the communities, that they need to they, they need to be more engaged in their, their broadband experience and, and how they kind of advocate for that. I'll ask you guys to just hold on, hold that thought for a second. Um, but Morita, let me just go quickly to you. I had a brilliant question that I teed up, which I can't remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you. I guess I was in the waiting room, but I did hear you. And thank you very much, Tim. And thank you for inviting MMTC. Um, to be there, to be here, to talk about some of the things that uniquely impact communities of color and low M income communities. And similar to, I'm, I'm glad that Matt got a chance to um, kick off with tribal communities um, because he really laid the framework for what some of the challenges are um, with some of our more marginalized communities. So I'd like to give a couple of statistics on what's going on um, overall. So the recent study from Pew indicated that more than 34% of Black and Latinx adults lacked home broadband as of the summer of 2019. John Horgan, who's a very popular researcher in the broadband space, um, has uh, reported that nationwide over 31% of Black, Latinx, and Indigenous families lacked high-speed home internet as of last um, summer. And um, as Matt reported, nearly one in five indigenous persons living on reservations lacked um, home broadband last summer. Um, and, and, and it's also, there's also an income um, element to this because nearly half of families that earn less than $25,000 annually and over a third of families earning between 25 and 50,000 lacked um, high, sp high speed internet access. Um, I, where we have a, um, the U.S. Census Bureau reports that since the pandemic, nine out of 10 households with school-aged children have had to participate in some sort of distance learning. Um, and then as we talked about you know, previously, lower income households tend to be, tend to be um, less capable of making that transition. In fact, our MMTC's new policy chief, Dr. Fallon Wilson reported, she's in Nashville, um, and is very involved in uh, bridging the digital divide there. She reported that in during the pandemic and the transition of children from in the classroom to um, uh, remote learning, 13,000 students disappeared just in that whole, the, the transition from being there in person to being there at home. And uh, nearly 17 million children are unable to participate in remote learning because their families don't have broadband access. And 9 million of those children are Black and Latinx um, children. So, um, you know, just some of the things with the pandemic have shed a light on these disparities, but the disparities were here all along. Um, going, thank you, Marita. Going to, going to Evan, um, obviously, uh, President Biden, one of the things he first did was you know, try to put together a plan of getting students back into school. Um, there's obviously challenges about that. Um, you know, teachers are concerned, um, but there is a desperate need to get them back into the classroom. Um, and, and I only mention that because um, it, it shows that you know, we really have a problem with you know, students having a diminished experience um, for long term and the importance of actually having you know, really good online uh, learning when it comes to when it comes to school. Can you talk about, you know, how you've been working in, in your experience with uh, connecting schools and students with teachers? Yeah, well, thank, thanks for having us here today. So um, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the work that we've done over the last eight years to bring high speed broadband to every public school in America. So uh, back in 2013, only 10% of students had uh, good internet access in, in their classrooms. And as of the start of the last school year, that number had risen to 99.7%. And the reason that was able to happen was because you had a couple of key elements. So first you had a goal, 
uh, you had a goal that had been set at the highest level by President Obama to bring high-speed broadband to 99% of classrooms. And so I think, you know, we've lacked a similar goal today. Um, you know, school districts have been trying to do things, states have been trying to do things, um, but we haven't had a national goal of, you know, either connecting every student or frankly, making sure that we close the digital divide and connect the 29 million households that don't uh, have home internet access today. So, so I think the first thing is, you know, somebody needs to step up and that somebody probably needs to be President Biden and set a national goal of, of connecting all, uh, all of our, uh, our households or our students. Um, the second thing that we've learned uh, from our previous experience and what we've been spending a lot of time working on is um, you need data. You need data about who is and isn't connected. It's really hard to solve a problem like this if you don't know where the problem is. And historically, um, we've not had good data on how which students aren't connected, which households aren't connected. Um, we've had surveys, we've had estimates, et cetera, et cetera, but we, we haven't known the specifics. And so we need to solve that problem. And then the third thing is we need funding. Um, you know, connecting the schools, uh, we had the E-rate program uh, to connect students and teachers at home and, and more broadly to connect the 29 million families that don't have internet access at home, we need funding. Um, you know, all, all the, the dialogue about the digital divide in, in DC and elsewhere has historically been, been focused on infrastructure. Oh, we need to build infrastructure to people who don't have it. And, and that's true, we do need to still build infrastructure. But by our estimates, um, something like uh, 60 to 60% 60 or maybe two thirds of the people who are not on the internet are not on the internet, not because they don't have internet available at their home, but because they can't afford it. Some of the things that Rita was talking about. And so we need a funding source to, to pay for that because we don't have one today. Well, um, Evan, uh, so you're saying that, you know, for the past decade or so, and, you know, say the net this year, is almost like a retrospective um, of the past decade. Um, you know, our focus the uh, past 20 years, actually, since E-rate, um, 25 years since E-rate, um, the, you know, the focus was connecting schools and libraries. And COVID has shown us that we have to connect um, students wherever they are. And that's been, a, that's been a challenge. You mentioned broadband mapping. Um, I, I, I mentioned the last panel to Nick and Matt that we could have an entire day on broadband mapping. And I'm not going to go too deep into it there. But let me go back to Matt. Um, with regard to, you know, Matt, Matt brought up, I mean, um, uh, Evan brought up the kind of emergency broadband um, funding that came out um, in, in the last round of, of congressional appropriations. And, and Senator uh, Congressman President Biden um, is looking to do something more. Um, how, how, do you, how do you view, you know, what's needed in that particular area for your community? So, I mean, we, we just saw, uh, you know, a billion dollars identified for tribal broadband connectivity um, in the last round. Um, and we see, um, you know, some focus on, on money and opportunity moving forward. We just need to make sure that, um, you know, there's a complicated scenario where a lot of people and funders don't understand or don't respect that the tribes have a federal to tribal government relationship. And so a lot of the funding mechanisms point money at a state and then try to trickle it through the state to the tribe, which is not where the relationship lies or the, or the trust responsibility. So we need to make sure that when they are devising the plan on distribution and deployment of these funds, that it doesn't somehow get caught in um, those traps where it becomes very awkward and, and complicated for tribes to get access to the funding. So we're also making sure you know, as much as possible that when they develop these programs um, and deployment methods and disbursement methods that they aren't um, adding interpretation or misinterpretation to, to the intent of that funding. And they're allowing tribes to do what needs to get done uh, and not putting restrictions on it that, um, you know, that, that would hinder them from being able to build their networks. Um, you know, missing middle mile is one of the biggest components in, in Indian country. Um, when, I, when I was working with uh, Obama administration and, and the CTO of the United States at the time, Megan Smith, we had done, and, and uh, a gentleman named Ericus Napius, uh, we, we identified 8,000 missing middle mile connector miles, right? Um, to the, to the, just the lower 48, the tribal reservations in the lower 48 states. Um, you know, 8,000 miles is a pretty big deficit. Uh, when you think about 
the funding and the availability that you see come across all the time, it's typically to build last mile or what we like to turn around and call first mile, which is uh, the connectivity to the tribal home and the tribal municipalities. But if you can't connect to the to the rest of the world with a, a proper amount of, of drain and, and affordability to that to that connection, then you're not going to be able to function in this space anyway. So, um, you know, middle mile will be one of the one of the key factors that needs to be uh, included in the ability to spend that money. You know, I think over the past decade since you know the the recession in two thousand in eight two thousand nine, and obviously during the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we've seen really quick disbursements of funds and there've been successes and, you know, maybe some failures. Um, I'd ask all of you, like how, how, you know, what's the, what are the lessons learned from those previous disbursements as we go forward to kind of solve, you know, this huge issue of folks that uh, don't have access to suitable broadband to, to be able to weather a pandemic like this? Well, I, I can take that. I think the lesson learned is to, to provide to the neediest first. Um, I um, am active um, in the Poor People's Campaign with Reverend Will William Barber, and he has an interesting approach where he says, we've tried you know, focusing on the middle class, we've done the trickle down approach, why don't we, and this is not just in broadband, but in all policies, why don't we focus on the areas and the people who are the most in need? Because if you take care of them, then everything else, you know, I guess maybe you can call it trickle up <laughs> um, or something, but um, the emergency broadband benefit, um, MMTC and National Urban League just filed comments with the Federal Communications Commission um, supporting, you know, this $3.2 billion um, uh, program um, that the Biden administration is um, championing that will provide uh, subsidies for both uh, very low income people, eligible fam low income families, and also people have been recently unemployed to help them to have a credit of either up to $50 um, and then up to $75 a month for tribal communities. And we think that that is the kind of targeted assistance that's needed. And that's a short-term solution, but I also saw that this morning the business roundtable appealed to the Biden administration to, to not just support the emergency broadband benefit, but to make it permanent because now you have the top CEOs that are getting involved and saying it's absolutely essential that everyone have access to broadband, not just during the pandemic, um, but, but thereafter. Yeah, cost is yeah. a big factor. I think Evan mentioned that as well, as well as Marita, so. Yeah, and, and if I could add in on that. So, you know, the, the broadband benefit is, is a great opportunity to make progress in, in, you know, tackling the digital divide. But I think the reality is that if the FCC doesn't reserve a portion of the fund for the unconnected, all the money is simply gonna to go to people who already have broadband today. It's gonna to be used by providers to subsidize their current customers. And that's because it's really hard to find new customers and it's you know really easy to go to the customers that you already have. And so I think that's a really critical issue that the FCC needs to address. I couldn't agree more with Marita. We need to make this benefit permanent. I'm not sure the format it's currently in is the right format for a permanent benefit because there are some, some challenges and, and one of the most important things I think that, you know, Congress did that is, is going to be a challenge, in, again, in connecting the unconnected is what we've learned over the last, you know, during the pandemic, but frankly, over the last 10 years, is that the families that don't have broadband, they struggle to advocate for themselves. They struggle to figure out what to do. They struggle to figure out how to sign up for these things. They struggle to have the credit ratings and the documentation that they need to be able to sign up for these programs. And what's worked, as we've seen 3 million kids during the pandemic get connected to broadband. And the reason those 3 million kids have been connected is because school districts and states stepped up as the buyers and, and, and they aggregated procurement. And, and I think if we're gonna solve this problem, that needs to be a core element of what we do. It's giving the aggregated purchasers, whether it's cities or counties or school districts or housing authorities, the ability to, to go out and, and buy on the behalf of these people who don't have internet access today. Matt, can you, can you comment on that? 
Yeah, one of the things I was going to say, uh, and, and Evan mentioned this, is like, how do you find the customer that doesn't have broadband that won't benefit from this emergency fund where, where there's a subsidy to help pay for your bill? Um, so we're, we're dealing with a, a system that, and, and I'm just going to call it like it is, it's flawed. So the FCC releases this uh, 706 report, which is based on 477 data, which is essentially the marketing and potential connectivity tool that that carriers use to identify you know th their service area and who who could be served by their services however they are not necessarily served yet so in a census block if uh, a carrier is able to perform a connection to a household in that service block um, whether it's done or not it, it can be counted so there's a very false um, sense of connectivity or coverage in the United States and we continue to run on this system that that looks at that data provided by the the companies that are are building these networks and it's not actual so the actual connectivity on the ground the actual homes connected in a census block is a, it's a far different number so you know there's a deficit in the thought process of of a lot of folks a lot of folks think well you know those communities are covered and the last 706 report that just came out um, this month um, is is very misleading. So you know we're we're working with a system that doesn't truly identify um, the missing households in those communities and the missing um, the missing participants in those census blocks. So and until we until we can shift focus on the actual on on the on the ground the actual numbers on the ground, we're going to have a tough time uh, aligning funds and and making sure that everybody's included in this process. And if I can just add to that, you know, the, the mapping stuff that Congress did in the Broadband Data Act and that they funded as part of the stimulus, that's great for understanding where the infrastructure is. But as Matt's saying, it's only half the question, right? It's one thing to know where the infrastructure is, but we also need to know who is and isn't subscribing. And if we don't know that, subsidy programs are, are not going to be able to be effectively deployed. They also get limited in the fact that if a census block could be served by a carrier that got federal funding to do so, they are no longer no longer eligible for federal funding to support that census block, and they may never get served from that from that perspective. Uh, let me let me just ask um, kind of a tricky question uh, as as the Biden administration tries to put together, you know, its administration and also figure out how to work with Congress on certain things. Um, what, what do you, do you have any recommendations for structuring the federal government to better deal with these issues? Um, you know, we, the, the federal communications commission, we had Jeffrey Stark's, um, keynote last night. He was our, was our uh, closing keynote and we had raised a lot of great issues, but you also have, you know, fund, you know, NTIA, which is in the department of commerce that has a role in this, um, particularly when it comes to a lot of spectrum issues. Um, and they did the last broadband stimulus in 2019. Um, you also have, um, uh, the Department of Agriculture, which also doles out, um, you know, funds and, and, and resources. And the FCC right now is a, in, in a bit of a problem with regard to its functioning over the next couple of years. Um, do, you, do you have any recommendations for the Biden administration on where they go from here? Uh, I from think that, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll well, I was up. just going to say that whatever, whatever they do, they've got to eliminate the silos. <laughs> and as you say, you know, you've got you know, um, NTIA has, you know, jurisdiction um, and in terms of it's the White House, you know, the White House is representative. You've got FCC and then with the regulatory area, you've also now got the Federal Trade Commission. So I think that it's almost like there needs to be a coordinating um, entity. Uh, in the past, NTIA has, you know, kind of played that role to make sure that agriculture, FCC, you know, that everybody coordinates um, on these things. So whoever, whoever they decide, it needs to be coordinated so that it's not so siloed. So that's, that's just my way in. So Marita, you, you feel like it's been siloed um, over the past? Yeah, I think it's been siloed, not just in terms of, you know, the funding, um, you know, opportunities and, you know, where they go, but just in terms of the agencies communicating, you know, with one another and really fully understanding their jurisdiction. I think it could definitely, um, uh, be uh, be much better. And that, that siloing uh, gets transferred to the communities that they serve as well. So if you have USDA funding under the RUS program, you operate in those parameters and those that fund doesn't 
you know, you can't kind of really commingle those funds with with another department's uh, funding efforts to get a better a better result by kind of aggregating things and working together with two different programs to solve a problem. You actually have to solve this problem independent of solving this problem because of the way this stuff is siloed. Now I know that um, that they've been um, requested or mandated maybe even to uh, to communicate between the departments. I know NTIA is working uh, to set up a structure with uh, USDA to be able to coordinate on these issues. And I, and I think that is, um, it is a key. Um, so, but for the, for the administration itself moving forward and, and how to better solve these problems, um, you know, I, th I think the mapping system and, and, you know, the FCC will own this, the mapping system is flawed and, and failed um, to be uh, a successful event. And the maps need to be, um, you know, better, better tooled to, to understand these issues. The, um, the biggest concern with the rollout of the Rural Digital Opportunities Fund uh, in that first round is that they're, they know where they don't have service. So their map is accurate to that level, but they don't know that in that pocket where there is no service, where they intend to reach out and serve, they're going to pass several communities that also don't have service, but they're not building those communities. So when they build out to that end point, they're not exactly incorporating the, the same type of thought process around infrastructure to be able to serve the entire pathway to that, that end point. So we were hoping that we could um, have them take a better look at, at mapping before they rolled out RDOF. And hopefully um, mapping will come into play before the second round of RDOF funding um, so that we can better assess who's along the route that you're building to at the end point um, to be able to serve them as well. Tim, the, the thing that I would say is I'd come back to, to what I was saying in the beginning. The Biden administration needs a clear, measurable goal that all of the different departments and agencies, and we have to remember the FCC is an independent agency that the administration does not control, um, but they need a clear goal that everyone is working towards that is measurable and they need to track progress against it. And number two, they need a strategy, an implementation strategy. Um, you know, his, historically, the federal government has been good on, you know, let's create funding sources, let's, you know, create policies that enable people to do things, but they haven't really focused on, okay, what is our clear measurable goal and what is our strategy from an execution point of view on how we're going to get there, given that the resources that we we have available. So I would say that's the most important thing for the Biden administration to do, but completely agree with what both Marita and Matt have said as well. Well, let, let me just um, let me just let Marita finish because I'm going to go to our next uh, keynote right after that. Um, I did notice that not many of you guys mentioned Congress itself, um, which uh, obviously is a monster role to play here. But um, Marita, let me just um, let me just give you the final word. Um, Congress is essential in all of this, and you know we're we're because they tend to be slower to act. I think we you know we advocate before the FCC and other agencies, so we tend to focus on them. But underlying all of this, Congress could solve all of these um, issues. And in addition to the communities that we've talked about, because we've talked about um, Black and Latinx um, communities, I also wanted to make sure that um, we make provision for um, senior citizens um, because that's another. Uh, community that's often getting left out. You know, we talked about tribal and we're talking about, you know, racial minorities, but senior citizens are also another community that we have to make sure that we don't forget about because um, it's essential that they be connected and supported um, in every respect. Absolutely. Well, and, and during COVID, they've suffered some of the, the hardest times because of lack of connectivity and lack of uh, access to health resources and telemedicine and such. Uh, on the tribal communities, especially. Right, and uh, I'm zooming from my grandmother's attic specifically for that you know, reason that people can't really come in here because of COVID. And so they, you know, a lot of seniors have become isolated. And right. um, so it's, we really do need to put some energy on seniors. Well, I mean, I think you have pretty good broadband from the attic, um, not, you know, and really a, a shout out to Matt, who's, who's zooming in from the Millennium Falcon, which is incredible broadband. <laughs> I, I need hyperspace at my disposal to get all this stuff done in time. So. 